Good evening, all, and uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I appreciate we've all got, um, you've all got very busy um, schedules, um, and I uh, appreciate the time you've made um, for to attend the webinar this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Eitzen, and I'm the Managing Director of Conde Australia. Uh, Conde Australia is part of the Conde Global Group. Um, touching on, um, on our agenda for tonight, a brief description about Conde. Uh, why do we need to humidifier? Um, humidification technologies, um, psychometrics, capacity and energy calculations. Isothermal and adiabatic humidification, the two different technologies. Um, low energy adiabatic humidification technology, that's the one that we're really looking for tonight. And then some compliance and regulations. Um, just a, a quick uh, word from Conde. Um, Conde has 700 employees. Um, our head office is in Fafikon in Switzerland. And uh, we, have, we have sales presence in about uh, 60 offices globally. We manufacture in uh, three, um, three plants uh, in Ottawa and Canada. Our main plant for the Australian product comes out of Hamburg, and we also manufacture in Beijing in China. Why do we, uh, why do we need to humidify? Um, uh, obviously, uh, when we talk about art galleries and museums, we talk about um, hygroscopic medium that um, has been painted on or um, their artworks are done onto hygroscopic medium and the medium uh, or the media really needs to be maintained at a, at a condition with very um, very small fluctuations. Hospitals, um, um, health, the health um, is a big topic um, recently um, regarding COVID-19 and the requirement for um, higher levels of medication that we've uh, experienced before in general in hospitals. Mainly uh, we see it in operating theatres. <clears throat> um, offices, not a subject in, in uh, much, and we don't see much demand for that in Australia. Printing areas and textile manufacturing, obviously to maintain the integrity of the, um, the product. Um, we see it in pharmaceutical processes, animal laboratories, and uh, data centres, um, where you have very high sensible loads and, um, and there's a requirement to maintain uh, relative humidity between um, two tolerances. These are some of the organizations that Conde has had um, been fortunate enough to provide equipment or Conde humidification and dehumidification um, equipment. <clears throat> right, so touching on um, um, one of the reasons for uh, humidifying is obviously um, to um, improve productivity. We see in Australia, um, um, crops, uh, mainly in data centers, we don't see much of the manufacturing um, uh, manufacturing line where we have humidification. Um, we see it in printing and packaging, uh, electronics, um, electronics where they are uh, manufacturing and um, populating circuit boards, um, spray booths. We do have applications as spray booths in Australia. Um, MRI scanners are very, uh, they have a tight tolerance for relative humidity in the space. Abattoirs, uh, we do humidification in abattoirs to maintain the weight of the product so the product doesn't lose um, weight. Those are all measures that improve the productivity of manufacturing processes. Um, in preservation, obviously, um, museums, uh, art galleries, and stately homes. Uh, normally, in the domestic environment, it is um, the the storage of um, musical instruments, uh, pianos, violins, that kind of stuff. Museums um, to protect the antiquities. Um, art galleries, once again, to preserve the artworks. Um, seed banks. Um, um, seed bank where they store long long term storage of seeds um, uh, so they can uh, come back to those seeds at a future time uh, instruments pianos etc libraries and archives <clears throat> um, one of the recent uh, events is is um, with covid 19 um, we've we've heard a lot about having higher humidities, um, maintaining humidities between 40 and 60%. Uh, 
um, when the humidity is is lower than 40%, um, the moisture that's carrying the virus um, evaporates and, and exposes the virus. Um, and the virus has the opportunity to travel further in the air. Um, whereas if the humidity is greater than between 40 and 60%, um, the virus, um, the, the moisture in the air tends to fall to the floor with the virus. Um, air, uh, airborne droplets containing viruses shrink by evaporation a lot and float for longer. Um, with, with, with obviously that's when we have low humidity in the space, all right? With between 40 and 60, the airborne droplets contain, contain the viruses, retain the moisture and are heavier and fall out of the air. Um, there's a couple of recent industry guidelines uh, on indoor humidity, which, which may be interesting. Um, error common questions from error about COVID 19 air conditioning refrigerators in September 2020, keeping relatively between 40 and 60 will create conditions that reduce the risk of infection through inhalation of airborne droplets carrying the virus. Low humidity in occupied buildings should be avoided as they can dry out the mucous membrane, which is one of our primary means of defense. Um, there are some guidelines, ventilation guidelines um, by SIBC, um, which recommend the rate humidity should be kept at 40% wherever possible. And then SIBC wealth and health, well-being in uh, building services. The recommended relative humidity range of is 40 to 60 in dwellings and air conditioned buildings and 40 to 70 elsewhere. Um, and there were some, also some guidelines on the HSE. HSE. Um, there are three <clears throat> different technologies when we talk about um, humidification technologies. The first is vaporization. And that's generally what you see in, um, in the steam steam production um, humidifiers that are very common throughout um, a lot of the installations in Australia. Basically, we need to uh, get the water in from the, from the liquid phase um, into the vapor phase. And to do that, um, we apply uh, energy or heat to a cylinder and the water changes phase to vapor and we introduce the vapor into the, the air conditioning system. The second um, method of doing it is evaporation, all right, um, which is um, vapor. Sorry, just step back. Right, vaporization is generally third, referred to on the on the psychometric process as the isothermal process. Um, evaporization um, is referred to as an adiabatic process. Um, so we distribute um, water onto material with a high surface area. We pass um, air through that, the air has energy. Um, the energy is absorbed by the water. The water absorbs the energy from the air and we have a phase change that takes place um, um, and uh, from phase from liquid to vapor in there, but the energy for that conversion comes from the airstream. Um, with that, with that, um, with the evaporation, obviously we have the adiabatic effect, which is the cooling effect. Um, atomization is a, is a, another adiabatic um, process um, whereby <clears throat> we uh, take very small droplets, introduce small droplets into the air and um, the droplets are very fine particles, say between one and 10 microns and um, they have a high surface area. They gain the, the, moisture, the, the heat from the air and they change phase um, in the air. Once again, atomization is a um, adiabatic process. So two types, two types of humidifier. The one on the left is an adiabatic humidifier. Um, you can see the nozzles which spray very fine particles, um, droplets um, into the air, um, and the airstream gains the heat out of the air and changes um, into a vapor. That's an adiabatic humidifier. On the right-hand side, um, we have a straight isothermal humidifier, very typical. This is uh, just steam, and steam has been, had the phase change done from water to vapor using uh, either some energy source, uh, mainly electric or gas. Um, we'll talk about the processes um, on, this, on the psychometric chart. Um, 
So the first process moving from left to right is the heating, sensible heating, <clears throat> isothermal humidification, adiabatic humidification or cooling, cooling and dehumidification. So in the isothermal process, we move um, vertically upwards. All right. In the adiabatic process, we move on the line of constant enthalpy. Um, so we'll go to, go to the isothermal, the isothermal humidification process. Um, we have uh, two conditions here. Um, we have a condition where we're renting, um, for instance, we're renting outside air at four degrees C, 40% RH, and we are required to go to 22 degrees C at 50% RH. So the first process is we introduce sensible heat, um, um, which brings us up to the required um, dry bulb temperature. And then we add, <clears throat> we add the moisture by way of vapor um, from the steam process. And we add, in this particular example, we add 6.22 grams per kilogram. Um, the, what, we, what we started the conversation by talking about um, adiabatic and low energy in adiabatic. So this being an isothermal process, all right, First of all, we need to calculate the duty of the humidifier. So the duty of the humidifier, very simple equation, volume of air, the change in moisture um, divided by the specific volume. So in the example that we had, 500 liters a second, um, a change from um, uh, two grams per kilogram to 8.2 kilograms over the specific volume. And the duty of that particular humidifier in those conditions is 13.2 kilograms per hour. Um, we, to calculate the energy in, the energy required to um, give you that moisture change, we can use the two lines of enthalpy and do a calculation based on the two lines of enthalpy. Um, so there's mass of the air, um, um, the total energy, you'll, the enthalpy change between the two enthalpy changes um, is 33.95 kilojoules per kilogram. Specific volume 8.46, once again, 500 liters per second or half a cubic meter per second. Um, we calculate the mass of air and the total energy that's required um, in that particular um, example is 20 kilowatts of power. I can, do, I can do that same calculation a different way. Um, I can do it by working out the sensible heating portion, um, calculating the sensible heating portion which is um, 10.5 kilowatts, okay? And to that, then I have to add the energy that's required to uh, boil the cylinder and to produce the steam. And that's a combination of, of uh, two, um, two inputs, the heat to go from 10 degrees to 100 degrees to boil and then to vaporize. So um, that is the 1.3 kilowatts and the 8.2 kilowatts plus the 10.5 kilowatts, all right, which is the energy there. Once again, 20 kilowatts. So in that particular example, we have demonstrated in two different methods of calculating that we require 20 kilowatts of, 20 kilowatts of energy to change between those two conditions. Now we look at the, the adiabatic um, or adiabatic process, uh, humidification process, um, sometimes referred to as, as, as the low energy process. So once again, we apply the sensible heat, <clears throat> but because of the adiabatic effect and the fact and the, um, the effect that uh, in the adiabatic effect there is cooling, we have to apply a second amount of heat, um, which takes us up to the line of constant enthalpy, um, which we then write up the line of constant enthalpy. And we once again get, uh, we add the 6.22 grams per kilogram you will notice there was two different components of energy. Okay, there was the first component to get up to the dry bulb, and then the second component of, of heat, sorry, the first component of the sense of heat was to get up to the dry bulb, and the second component was get the dry bulb to the line of constant enthalpy. When, <clears throat> when, the, air, when, when the airstream imparts its heat onto uh, onto the, the droplets, okay, we have an adiabatic effect. And in this example, the adiabatic effect is 
15 degrees of cooling. So we, we do the same example and um, we, we, now we heat there, we go back and we look at, at the conditions. We had to heat there from four degrees to 37 degrees. All right, and volume remains the same. Um, specific volume remains the same, 33 degrees C change. And we find that the energy um, to do that particular between those two conditions was once again 19.8. It's a nominal 19.8 because there's some rounding errors in there, um, but nominal 20 kilowatts. So the, the isothermal process, which is a steam process, and the adiabatic process, often referred to as the lower, lower energy process, effectively require the same amount of energy to go between two points on the cycle chart. And I think we all knew that, all right? So basically it makes no difference in total energy using isothermal or the adiabatic process. The savings in adiabatic humidification is the energy cost to heat the air may be way less than the electrical cost to boil water for steam. So for instance, if you were simply using, the, in the adiabatic system, if you were using electric, electric heating, it would make no sense to use to do adiabatic humidification. But if you were using your heat source, um, was say available from a uh, heat pump chiller or something, some uh, heat pump source that had a better COP than one, okay, it makes sense to uh, um, consider using an adiabatic um, humidification system. So from those conversations, there was three rules of thumb. And this is, this is a, Approximate these approximations um, that we generally use. So for every thousand liters per second of fresh air, the approximate requirement for humidity is 25 kilograms per hour of humidity is needed. Um, for every 100 kilograms of steam, approximately 0.75 kilowatts of electrical power is needed. And for every one kilogram of cold water evaporated, you produce um, 680 watts of evaporative cooling. So um, isothermal, back to uh, the steam humidifiers are very, very easy to apply. Um, they're relatively good controllability. They have latency, unfortunately, because you have to boil the cylinder and get the steam. They are easy to install and they're a low cost investment. All right. um, they aren't very energy efficient. Um, so that's a consideration. They also kill, because of our temperature, they kill a lot of pathogens and that's why they're preferred in a lot of health applications. So um, isothermal um, humidifiers come in uh, basically a couple of shapes and forms, but um, the normally entry level is what we call a electrode uh, boiler, which works on the conductivity of the water and um, moving uh, the level of the water and the conductivity of the water um, <clears throat> causes the current to pass through the water and we create steam. This, this is um, sort of the low cost, um, simple, um, low capital cost um, uh, unit, um, high energy consumption that does use a lot of, uh, there are consumable, quite high spare consumables and um, controllability is probably plus or minus 10%. Um, when you go one step up on the isothermal, you go to resistive humidifiers. These typically depending on, on the, the water quality, um, can be controlled between two and 5% RH, um, depending on the application. Um, they, once again, they're available in the full range of sizes. Um, the resistive of low spares commitment and can basically walk on any, on any water quality and they're good for close control. Um, you can typically control um, pretty much between two and 5% RH. Now we get to um, adiabatics, which is um, uh, what we've come here to talk about. <clears throat> right, so adiabatic humidifiers uh, are available from in, uh, I would generally say uh, from you know, very small sizes around uh, two to three kilograms hours up to a couple of hundred kilograms hour. Um, adiabatic um, humidifiers offers, offer cooling. Um, um, they have a, they can have a, a relatively low um, spatial requirement if you can put them in an anning unit. They're considered uh, lower carbon footprint, obviously, because of the energy 
energy usage or the potential to use an alternative energy source, uh, minimum power consumption. They do have um, they do have some requirements um, in that uh, the preventive maintenance is a little bit more onerous. Um, and uh, in winter time, when generally when you got the high humidification loads, uh, you have to provide the ash additional uh, additional winter the additional heating to overcome the adiabatic effect. Um, some um, adiabatic humidifiers, for instance, ultrasonic humidifiers, require reverse osmosis water, RO water. We'll discuss that a little later. Um, and they are, um, you've got to consider um, two-point control when you are using these devices. So um, this, the first adiabatic humidifier we're talking about is the ultrasonic humidifier. So in an ultrasonic humidifier, um, in essence, you have a, a very shallow bath of water. Um, and um, the, the, the bath has um, ultrasonic transducers that sit along the bottom surface of the, of the, of the humidifier. And they oscillate about 1.7 megahertz. And by oscillating, they create um, <clears throat> little roses that or little um, cones that form on the top of the surface of the water. Um, and there's cavitation by virtue of the fact of the 1.7 megahertz um, oscillations. And um, that breaks the surface tension. And when breaking the surface tension, it releases very fine droplets of water into the very fine droplets of um, moisture rink there. Now, don't forget these Droplets are typically between um, one and five microns in size. Um, and you, the droplets then need to gain the heat from the air to um, have the phase change. Um, the picture you see on the right hand side um, is an um, actual installation um, with uh, two, uh, um, two ultrasonic humidifiers that have been installed. Uh, and you can see the fine, uh, the fine mist that comes out uh, from the uh, the ultrasonic humidifier. Um, you will notice as well that uh, after a period of time, maybe one or two meters, you'll see the mist disappears. At that point, um, the uh, the droplets have gained enough energy from the air to to have the phase change, and um, be, um, the airstream becomes clear again. There are a couple of restrictions um, when you're in, um, installing or, or when you're considering using um, ultrasonic humidifiers. <clears throat> they are obviously, they are um, quite large in size. Um, and you have to consider that um, they have a, they are cold water devices. So the maintenance requirement um, requires that they are serviced regularly um, uh, quarterly, in fact, um, AS uh, 366 part two requires them inspected monthly, but service quarterly. Um, and so you have to have um, reasonable and good access into the ductwork um, or into the anding unit, wherever you install the ultrasonic humidifier um, so that they can be easily uh, maintained. Um, there's a preference that uh, you have laminar flow uh, across the surface of um, the um, ultrasonic humidifier. In this instance, this is a duct installation, and they've installed a perforated plate um, upstream of the of the uh, ultrasonic humidifier. The limitations um, in terms of veloc duct velocity are between one and four meters per second. Um, any, um, anything above four meters per second um, requires a droplet eliminator, okay, which seems pointless because you're using RO water. Um, you're um, then atomizing and putting it there and then you're catching it on the drop uh, on a droplet eliminator um, um, the one one meter per second is the lower limit um, the, the lower velocity limit that you can typically use on an ultrasonic humidifier um, the, the one of the factors that you need to consider when um, um, thinking of using ultrasonic technology ultrasonic adiabatic technology and that is the, um, that the absorption distance um, or the distance that it takes the, the droplet to gain the heat from the air and change its phase uh, can be quite long. Okay. 
Um, hence the requirement um, to uh, typically use less than four meters per second, right, because it, <clears throat> um, in the duct. So this particular illustration here illustrates um, the condition of the air leaving. So for instance, um, if we, uh, we use the 50, um, well, 75%, which is this blue line, okay, and we have um, velocity of say three meters a second, your absorption distance is about three meters. Now, uh, that typically is a lot longer um, than, um, uh, to look longer than isothermal uh, humidifiers, who, who the absorption distance is normally uh, anything from you know, 600 to a meter. It, um, it does, um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't lend itself very well to retrofitting a, um, an existing air ending unit system from an isothermal to a ultrasonic system. Um, and we, uh, the reasons being is um, <clears throat> um, the velocities, because most, most ducting is sized in the four to six meter, um, four to six meters per second uh, velocity range. Um, and the duct, therefore the duct, uh, the duct um, profile or the, the duct um, cross-sectional area is typically a bit too small to install um, uh, ultrasonic humidifiers and you have to uh, make some kind of um, transition piece to, to fit them in. Um, also the fact that the absorption distance is longer, that's always not, that's never, that's not always possible to have the additional absorption distance. Um, we have in the past um, been involved in, in projects where they need to, where they wish to use ultrasonic um, uh, humidifiers and the ducting um, is not suitable. In this instance, um, we've uh, used what we call a side stream. Um, so we, <clears throat> this is a data hall that has a pressurized um, ceiling um, pushing the returner back to the cross. Um, and so what we physically did was um, we introduced a side stream that pulled the air out of the out of the ceiling and um, pushed it through um, through the uh, humidifier and then pushed it um, pushed it back with a fan back into the ceiling. But obviously with a higher um, the higher moisture load, um, the, the question I'd probably ask as well. You'd think that the that the the crawl would strip the moisture back out again. But um, in general, um, the, those, that particular job ran at high chill water temperature, so it doesn't strip the moisture out. So there is an opportunity um, to retrofit um, ultrasonic humidifiers, but you need to obviously consider the consider the uh, the challenges of the absorption distance. Um, some of the good points of, um, of ultrasonic humidifiers, uh, very controllable. Um, normally there are multiple um, ultrasonic uh, heads, uh, ultrasonic transducers that are on the base of the tray. So you can get very, very um, good and tight tolerances. Um, you, you get uh, very small droplet size, which allows um, um, the state change to take place um, quicker. Um, the, the, one of the considerations is that with, um, with ultrasonic humidifiers, you do need to use RO water. So the minerals, uh, the minerals that are in the water have to be removed um, prior um, to, to, the, um, to them going into becoming um, droplets in the air because once they get the phase change, you end up with um, the minerals are left behind and you end up with a white powder coat that poke, that'll coat you know the ducting and it'll actually um, come out around the fuses and stuff like that so the recommendation um, always is that um, with ultrasonic humidifiers you need to consider you need to you need to consider that you need to use RO water um, and RO water there are some um, penalties with RO water and the fact that <clears throat> You probably um, you you know between one and two liters um, goes to waste for every one liter that you you manufacture, and then obviously one of the considerations is the longer absorption distance. Um, uh, another uh, method of um, 
uh, adiabatic or evaporative type um, humidifiers. Um, is there just a straight media media humidifiers? Um, these are typically used for high humidity outputs. Um, you mean with loads that are typically around, you know, you could have them up to two, three hundred kilograms. Um, the good part about it is that there's very short, um, very short evaporation distance because the the phase change happens on the surface of the media, and um, in that case, the um, the phase change has already occurred. You don't have any droplets. You don't have any carryover. Um, the control uh, in uh, evaporative media type humidifiers um, is um, plus or minus 10 percent because basically you have um, stage valves um, which um, control each of the stages um, to determine your the amount of moisture that you're carrying over into the air. So it is, um, it's in steps. Uh, you can have the stages up to um, typically from two to seven steps. You need to also obviously consider the preheating requirements um, because if the air if the air doesn't have enough heat in it upstream of the evaporative media humidifier, um, you uh, you cannot the phase change won't take place and most of the um, most of the water that's running down the pads will just end up back in the drain and recirculating. Um, that's just an ME. Um, showing you the different the two different medias in there. Um, the one on the left is a glass fiber, fiber media and the one on the right hand um, side is a polyester fleece media. Um, the, it is also possible to do a bit of hygiene control um, in the, uh, in, with um, vapor meters by putting UV sterilization, um, UV submerged UV sterilization tubes in the sump of the, of the humidifiers. Um, there are a couple of other unique um, opportunities um, for um, evaporative or adiabatic style humidity. This is a high pressure system, um, basically very high pressure from a high pressure pump, uh, spraying very fine particles uh, into the into the airstream, and then um, uh, down the um, obviously the phase change takes place and goes down the duct. Um, a bit more, a bit, uh, bit more technical, um, but um, easy to apply for existing applications. Um, this is this picture is a high pressure fogging system that uh, was installed for a Facebook, um, a Facebook uh, data center. Um, this is a <clears throat> what we refer to as a hybrid. Uh, so it's a spray and evaporative humidifier. Um, this has two different sets, it uses um, two different sets. It actually, sp it, it sprays, um, it, it doesn't have um, a pump of such high pressure as a, as a high pressure system, but it um, sprays out in, um, in, with nozzles into the airstream. Um, part phase change takes place. Um, so the nozzles atomize the, the um, the moisture or the, the water into the air. Um, so we have a bit of a phase change and then the, um, the, the moisture that's still in the air that hasn't had the phase change strikes a, um, a ceramic wafer. The ceramic wafer um, has, uh, it's multi, it's uh, got a series of holes and crevices, unusual holes and crevices. The air can pass through very low pressure drop through the units. Um, but on the surface, uh, the water, when it hits the surface of the ceramic media, um, it evaporates off the surface media. So it's a low pressure drop alternative to a um, evaporative pad. Um, very, very good uh, control, 2% RH control. Um, and consider there are some considerations um, in that uh, you should consider um, using RO water on these units. Um, the good parts uh, on these um, hybrid systems where you've got spray, atomization, and evaporation um, is that they can fit into an air handling unit that only require about 600 millimeters of um, uh, absorption distance, um, low maintenance, and obviously you have the, the evaporative cooling effect. Um, <clears throat> that's one in, uh, one in, in, in life. Okay, these are the nozzles. So this is the atomization on the left. And on the right, right, you've got the ceramic wafers 
um, uh, which help the evaporation to take place. So basically atomize, okay, and evaporate. So the adiabatic um, humidification considerations, um, you have to consider the adiabatic cooling effect um, during your calculations. Um, uh, when you're considering that your highest humidity demand is typically in winter. Um, so you will need to overcome the cooling from the adiabatic or the low energy uh, humidifier um, during the winter. Um, energy savings will be realized only by the merits of the COP of the heating plant. So if the heating plant has um, uh, reverse cycle and has good COPs, then there are certainly benefits to go to um, low uh, low energy adiabatic humidification systems. Okay, heating using um, <clears throat> electric heaters um, does not utilize the energy advantage of lower energy humidifiers. So if you're heating with electric, um, there's probably no advantage at all going to adiabatic style humidifier. Uh, you need to consider um, potable or aura water. Uh, which is suitable for the, the technology that you choose. And then you also need to consider that AS3666 Part 2 has some more stringent maintenance requirements um, in terms of cold water humidification. Um, this is just an example <coughs> that we did um, comparing um, cold water. In this case, it was an ultrasonic unit um, with a steam humidifier. Uh, the load uh, 100, was 130 liters a second. We were looking for 18 degrees at 65 percent RH. Um, the heating plant had a CO, had an effective COP of about three. Um, the we ran a numbers for the year for the humidification load for the year, and basically the ultrasonic came in at about 512 dollars uh, to run for the year, as opposed to a traditional uh, steam unit, which came in at about 1,277 dollars for the year. Um, so there are there are benefits um, there, there are benefits to consider the low energy options, um, but as I said before, it's the COP of the heating equipment um, that will determine whether it has the benefits will actually work on that particular project. Um, some other considerations um, in humidification are the requirements of AS three triple six part one, <coughs> which um, Need you to to um, the first part is obviously is pretty obvious that the humidifier that's installed, no matter what it is, needs to be interlocked with the handling unit system. Um, the duct work, um, the duct work that uh, the section of what we call the humidification section of ducting needs to be uh, constructed of a non-corrosive material. Typical, typically, contractors use. Um, 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 stainless steel, three or four stainless steel to, to build the section. And um, it needs to be uh, graded or drained to a point. And the length, uh, the length of the humidification section um, needs to be considered um, uh, to be matched with the humidification technology uh, that you intend using and the absorption distance of that technology. Um, there are some got some VHBA engineering guidelines. Um, I believe this is the late, a copy of the latest um, VHBA engineering guidelines. Um, typically, um, the guidelines favour um, um, isothermal humidification, um, and we did discuss this a bit. You know, had a bit of a discussion about this last night. Um, Four point nine five. It says. Um, Evaporative water systems or cold water systems should not be used to provide humidification healthcare facilities. Reservoir type humidifiers or evaporative pan type humidifiers should not be used in duct work or handling units in healthcare because the risks opposed to the patient care and spreading of disease. Um, you can use, I mean, that's just saying that you can't use um, any cold water storage devices. So that does in a way rule out. Um, evaporative media and it does in some instances rule it does rule out um, ultrasonics okay um, however there are opportunities to use um, something like the hybrid system which uses um, atomizers um, nozzles to atomize and um, and um, media uh, by way of ceramic media to evaporate okay so there are no pools of water okay there are no open pools of water 
uh, in that kind of um, in that kind of application. Okay, um, they go on to say that um, they are known to leak, corrode, and cause other maintenance problems as they age. Um, ideally, direct steam injection humidifiers are preferred. Um, I think um, <clears throat> that most humidifiers, if they are aged, okay, they, they all do tend to leak and corrode. So I think it applies equally to uh, low low energy style or adiabatic type humidification and direct steam humidification. Um, the last is just a bit of a table whereby um, we talk about the various technologies and the considerations, um, water quality, uh, what you require. Um, for instance, um, <clears throat> the high pressure adiabatic requires RO water and requires additional heating coil of some sort or heating, heating energy. Um, uh, evaporative pad, you could use mains water, um, obviously heating once again. And uh, on the right hand column is the space requirements uh, when fitting when fitting this in, in typical duct work or within air handling units. Um, we have uh, available on our website, www.condair.com.au. We have uh, all technical manuals, BIM files. Um, there's a psychometric calculator on there. And there's most, uh, most things that you require to need if you were looking for a humidification um, application. <clears throat> Uh, we offer services in uh, design, um, installation, commissioning service, site survey, and risk assessment of, of any uh, humidification system that's out there, whether it's a condo or an alternative vendor. Okay, um, thank you very much, and um, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ian. Um, I'll open the floor now to some questions. Um, we haven't received anyone tonight, so... Just from myself, Ian, thanks for the presentation. Um, my summary of it is it's not as easy as I thought it might be to go down in a low energy solution. Um, the presentation pretty much highlights that, correct me if I'm wrong, unless you have a low energy solution on the heating side, um, you won't see the same benefits that you might initially start out thinking about. Um, um, and correct, and you're one hundred percent correct there, because um, we often get called into projects where um, they look into, um, let's say, right size the energy bills, etc. And the first, um, the first reasoning is we'll go to something that's lower energy, and they talk about you know various methods. Okay, it's pretty difficult to retrofit a system um, um, into the lower energy environment unless you have some kind of heating source um, that has a better COP than, than one, okay? Uh, and um, normally there are some space constraints um, when we most, uh, uh, isothermal humidifiers are generally squeezed into any little space they can. So it's not, a, it's, not, um, it's, it's not that it's not doable, it's just difficult to do on a retrofit situation. However, if you're planning a new project and you're starting off a new project, okay, um, with the right planning and um, the right considerations, um, it's very uh, very easy to achieve a, a low energy uh, humidification outcome. Um, it just needs obviously it needs the planning and it needs the engineering to achieve that. And um, and we have some very successful uh, case studies that we can share. Okay, um, I'd just like to point out if anyone would like to ask a question, um, please post it in the Q&A section. So use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to hover, type, and then I can see them and ask Ian directly. Um, is there any other questions from anyone? No. Ian, yes, I'd like yes. to thank you for your time. If I don't have any more questions coming from anyone. Um, one of the other ones I wanted to sort of talk about to anyone online was the, the slide that you picked up on the fact that the Victorian health guidelines on the use of um, humidifiers. So that screen was at 
that 4.95. There it is, there it is, that, that one really is um, for those. Um, it, it's certainly going to be a discussion point if the government wants us to go to low energy solutions. What you're basically pointing out, it's very difficult to do it in a health environment, which is where we're going to see humidification almost always, humidification requirements almost always. It's very hard to achieve it if we've got that clause, that very first sentence um, there under section 4.95. Um, they certainly, um, they certainly spell it out, you know, evaporative water system should not be used to provide humidification in healthcare facilities. But then they go on to sort of, I think, clarify, frame, frame why they've actually said that. So they say reservoir type humidifiers or evaporative pan type humidifiers, okay? So I think the biggest concern is that you have um, possibilities to have, let's say, bodies of water that are stagnant or stationary, all right, if you don't have the right management or the right hygiene routine and controllers to do that, okay? But there are, there are humidification systems um, such as the high pressure, such as the, the hybrid, the DL, okay, whereby you don't have a pan of, there is no pan of water that's standing around, mm. Uh, and they are very controlled. In fact, they are controllable to, you know, 2%. Um, they are used, um, the, especially the hybrid, the DL is used uh, in Europe in a lot, in, in most in extreme uh, um, um, health situations uh, where hospitals, are, there's no, uh, in fact, the uh, European office, um, I've often asked us why we don't, why we can't sort of um, find a market um, for that kind of product in the health system, you know, I think it's. Uh, I think it might. Be, it might. Have, this particular clause might have been constructed. With it's that. a legacy clause rather than a reflection of current technology. Correct. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. um, I mean, it would be good to uh, spend a bit of time and a bit of a case study with the right with the right people and try and show them what is available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions from anyone, um, I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending tonight's presentation. And thank you most definitely, Ian, for your presentation and time tonight. Yep. On behalf of SIBSI, I'd like to thank you. Thank Cheers. you very much. Thank you very much. And um, with that, we'll stop the presentation and sign off. Yeah, good thank evening. You. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.